we've tried uh, for two years to arrange to have today's speaker here. Um, it's a he is a speaker, and this is a topic uh, on which he is extremely expert. That we've I've been very keen to present uh, to the to the public, um, and to introduce him is someone who will be known to you if you attended the last of the forum events for last year, uh, because uh, it was he who lectured on that occasion from his book on the warfare state, uh, and that's Jim Sparrow, Adrian's colleague from the Department of History. So, Jim, will you come and do the honors? Well. Um, it's my honor and my great pleasure to introduce Adrian Johns, who will speak today on the politics of media piracy. Mr. Johns is the Alan Grant McClear Professor in the Department of History and the College, as well as the Chair of the Committee on the Conceptual and Historical Studies of Sciences at the University of Chicago. He's the author of three books. The first is titled The Nature of the Book, Print and Knowledge in the Making, put out by the University of Chicago Press in 1998. This is quite literally, for those of you who have seen it, it's, it's a big book. Uh, it's over 700 pages in length. The bibliography alone stretches more than 65 pages of, in, in eight-point font, no less. Um, but more importantly, it's, it's also big in, that, in the more significant sense uh, in, in its contribution to our knowledge. Uh, accordingly, it won several prizes, and I'll just list a few. The Leo Gershoy Award of the American Historical Association, that's the most important uh, professional body of historians. This award's for the most outstanding work published in English on any aspect of 17th and 18th century European history, so that's quite a portfolio. Uh, the John Beth, so the John Ben Snow Prize of the North American Conference on British Studies. And the nature of the book also won the Lewis Gottschalk Prize for the American Society for 18th century studies. Uh, Professor John's second book, Piracy, the Intellectual Property Wars from Gutenberg to Gates, also put up by the University of Chicago Press uh, in 2009, was also a big book. You could certainly uh, knock someone over the head with it and, uh, and prevail in an argument, um, again, in both senses more than 600 pages and, and a profoundly uh, um, enlightening and, and edifying uh, uh, study of more than 400 years of uh, intellectual history and, and much else uh, within modern history. This too won several awards. The Book of the Year for the American Society for Information Science and Technology, the Gordon J. Lang Award, which the University of Chicago Press awards to a faculty author who brings the press the greatest distinction that year. Um, and this book has already been translated into Italian and is in the process of being translated into Spanish, Arabic, and Czech, which gives you a sense of just um, how, how important its contributions are to the contemporary uh, discussion of uh, intellectual property, piracy, and, and related issues. Professor John's third book is titled Death of a Pirate. British Radio and the Making of the Information Age, which came out with W.W. W. Norton in, 19, in 2010. That book's already been translated into French, so we get a sense here that there's a momentum building here for this, for the message that Professor Johns seeks to convey to us. Uh, this exciting and influential body of work has already won Professor Johns several prestigious uh, fellowships from the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Science Foundation, the American Philosophical Society, and most recently, from the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation. So, Professor Johns has been a very busy man. Uh, he's preoccupied his mind with many things during these years of ferment, not least of which include question of books and their larger significance in Western culture and, and, and Anglo-American culture, of printing presses, and more broadly, the production and dissemination of knowledge in the modern world. More recently, he's concerned himself with patents, uh, licenses, copyright, and more broadly, the boundaries between public sphere and private property whose maintenance shapes our world today. He's even written a book about rogue radio operators in 1960s Britain. But beneath it all is a preoccupation with the foundations of modern culture and ideas and the historical developments that produced a precarious but essential balance between creativity and commerce that has defined much of modernity. 
His work charts the origins of the development of the public sphere, um, first within print and then later among the jostling innovations offered by other communications media. But the historical line of sight uh, that he provides in both the nature of the book and in piracy moves us beyond Habermas's often cited conceptualization of the public sphere, as, it, as he called it, and well beyond the teleological assumptions that lingered long after Marshall McLuhan coined the term Gutenberg galaxy. These books by Professor Johns reveal the surprising ways in which print culture, so vital to modernity itself, emerged from messy conflicts in many realms, ranging from material culture to commercial practices, institutions, the high politics, just to name a few. So what does all of this have to do with piracy, you might be asking yourself. After all, today's debates about piracy seem far removed from such rarefied questions. They center on intellectual property, and they take place in high-powered courtroom battles, which are endlessly dissected on specialist blogs that take for granted a working understanding of arcane treaties like ACTA or proposed laws like SOPA and PIPA. And here I'm not talking about relatives of the British royalty, uh, for those of you who know about those laws, but laws that seek to regulate intellectual property in the global, global domain. These battles make headlines every day. It seems that every other day we read stories about intellectual property wars, most recently um, Apple's, uh, uh, Apple computers patent wars with its competitors like Samsung. We read about piratical rogues who defy the owners of intellectual property like Kim.com, the one-time teen internet whiz and inside trader whose uh, founding of Mega Upload finally brought him to justice. And about other disruptors of intellectual propriety such as Julian Assange, uh, the leading light of WikiLeaks. But the outlaws are not only comic book cutouts like Assange or Kim.com. Increasingly, it seems that all of us may be implicated, or at least that we'll receive legal notice to that effect anyway. A vigorous prosecution of online downloading of music and video has placed ordinary citizens like Jamie Thomas of Capitol Records v. Thomas into the crossfire. And just this morning, I learned about a new piece of malware that installs itself onto people's computers and tricks them into forking over money um, by convincing them that the FBI has contacted them about their illegal downloading and, and has, uh, is identifying illegal files on their hard drive, which of course is not true, but they pay up anyway just to be safe, which seems to reflect the legal strategy of the RIAA as well. It would seem <clears throat> that the ever encroaching grasp of intellectual property lawyers has brought us all into a mannequin world of infringement and legality. And we all want to remain on one side of that bright line. Yet the story is far more complicated than that. <clears throat> the pirates turn out to have done as much cultural work as their adversaries. To understand why, you must read piracy. And there you will learn that our contemporary preoccupations with intellectual property and how to think about it have been warped by anachronism. A much, much longer time frame is necessary. Flip to chapter two of privacy, of, of piracy. <laughs> Interesting uh, slip there. Uh, flip to chapter two of piracy, and you'll find a discussion of patents and restoration in England when an absolutist political economy almost subsumed the free press in a crown controlled system of publishing. Immanuel Kant makes an appearance toward the end of chapter three, which discusses the centrality of piracy to the Enlightenment itself. One discovers in chapter eight that we all belong to a nation founded by pirates. And I'm not talking about Australia. It turns out those revolutionary pamphlets were more than simple appeals to common sense. They were part of a revolution in the public sphere that depended on piracy as a template for national politics of a sort. By the last chapters, we have returned to more familiar and a more contemporary landscape of copyright wars, patent battles, and countercultural practices like freaking and fudding. But the view looks quite different, having traversed over 400 years of history. I'll leave it to Professor Johns to explain his distinctive point of view on all of this. It, it certainly has a jarring effect on our received assumptions, as only the best scholarship does. <clears throat> 
If I may, uh, in coming to a close, indulge a reference of pop culture um, as such an august affair. His, uh, Professor Johns's book, Piracy, has something of it, the effect of the infamous Monty Python short, The Crimson Permanent Assurance, which intermittently interrupts their comedic sketch film, The Meaning of Life, from 1983. Now, if you've seen this film, you'll know that it begins in a rather bland way with a narrator referring to the bleak days of 1983 when the film is made, so it's in a, an imaginary future, when a ruinous monetarist policy has reduced England uh, to, uh, to, to ruins. And, um, and we pan in on an accounting firm, once a proud family-owned firm, now under new, Amer uh, new management, looks like American management, looks like MBAs, possibly from certain graduate schools of business that we know. And they're walking the hallways and flashing between these dull scenes of aging accountants and MBAs is um, a scene of the same actors as uh, slave masters and slaves in a Roman galley being whipped. Finally, the MBA turns on his heel and says, that's it, Evans, you're fired. And a murmur goes around, he's being sacked. All of the elderly accountants rise up in mutiny and, um, and eventually eject the new management, making them walk the plank. Well, being Monty Python, of course, you know you're only halfway through uh, the, the crazy world that you're about to be brought through. Um, at that point, the elderly accountants decide to go out on their own and, and, um, and become buccaneers. The building in which they worked was covered with scaffolding, um, and they hoist those as sails, and the, their office building sails off um, to richer uh, seas in, in, in the United States. Um, and, uh, and, they, and they sail out up, uh, to depend upon the fat, bloated merchant banks that await in the glistening American downtowns. Soon they board uh, an adjacent high-rise building, shooting filing cabinets as if they were cannon. Um, and, they, uh, and they successfully sack a, a corporate office, using uh, office implements as if they were weapons um, the fight scenes here are, are hilarious. At one point, there's a standoff, and an MBA stands on the table and says, Roberts, get the balance sheets. <laughs> and then another, while dialing, hands the, uh, an important file to his fellow MBA and says, file this. Um, eventually, the, the young management give up, and, um, and the elderly accountants uh, continue on their career of, of successful piracy. And then the narrator takes over, and you see the the, the, um, the building slash boat sail off into the distance, and the narrator says, as the sun set in the west, the outstanding, uh, the outstanding returns on their bold business venture became apparent. Once proud financial giants lay in ruins, their assets stripped, their policies in tatters. Um, and so they set out to sail on the wide accountant sea into the ledgers of history, and then we hear a sort of a break, and the narrator says, or, or so it would have been if certain theories of the shape of the, of the world hadn't proved disastrously wrong and the boat slash ship falls off the edge of a flat earth. <laughs> well, the, the extended metaphor here is stretched ever so slightly. These are, after all, elderly accountants working for an insurance firm, not stationers or recording companies or other firms that uh, Professor Johns talks about. But the similarities are striking. And as piracy shows, the line dividing the pirates and their nemeses were often somewhat illusory, or certainly not what they seemed. One cannot help wondering if we don't see in the unforeseen end of the Crimson Permanent Assurance the impending fate that awaits the intellectual property warriors as they chart their flatlander map of the world of cultural exchange. Land pirates, by the way, turns out to be the worst insult you can hurl at your opponent amidst these sorts of wars. Um, and perhaps their opponents believe they're charting a course to Libertalia, the mythical Republic of Pirates, and what is now Madagascar that was reported in Captain Charles Johnson's General History of the Pirates in 1724, possibly authored by Defoe. But such speculations concern the future. The historian's proper domain is the past. And so now I turn you over to a master of this particular past, Adrian Johns. So thank you very much, Jim, and thanks to the other Jim and the 
the staff of the Frankie for setting this up. Um, that, that introduction actually, you know what, I, I saw that film, but I saw it so long ago that I'd completely forgotten that entire sequence, and it's just, now you mention it, kind of brings, I think, images of it back into my head. The only, I think in common with many British people, the only scene that I remember from that film is the Wafir Thin Mint from later on. Um, anyway, uh, Jim has, has highlighted um, very, very accurately a number of the things that I, I think, uh, some of the points that are worth making about media piracy today and, and why, how it has a politics. Um, so I'm going to be, I guess, to some extent building on things that he's just said in the introduction. Um, as he said, the, the, I wrote this big fat book called Piracy. He accurately said you could hit people over the head with it. Um, and it did get translated into Italian and I forget what other language, Czech or something. Um, the most interesting kind of post-publication experience that I had about that book actually happened in Italy when the, it, it so happened that coinciding with the translation of it, there was a big uh, fair for booksellers in Venice, and I got invited to come and give a talk about piracy, and I thought, well, it's Venice, so I'll go. And, and I went along and did this talk, and there was an amazing amount of interest by the Italian media. So I found myself doing interviews with the radio and television and newspapers, and one of the big Italian newspapers even printed the speech, which has never happened to be in the States. Um, and uh, And, you know, flattering as that all was, after a while it became a bit baffling. I, was start, I started to think, why are they so interested in this? And in the end, I, I asked a few of these journalists and, and you know, op-ed writers and so forth what the stakes were for them. And it turned out that they all said the same thing. It had to do with a combination of WikiLeaks and Silvio Berlusconi. Um, this was at the time when the Berlusconi regime was, was you know, causing right-thinking Italians to tear their hair out. And um, they, they realized that there was a, a kind of fundamental political problem posed by Berlusconi, which was this. If you're a, a, a kind of normal, soft left, no, small S, small D social democrat, you place a lot of faith in the freedom of the press. And the idea is that in a, in a normal society with freedom of the press, eventually the bad things that a government does will become known and they will, it will be voted out of office. The trouble with that under Berlusconi was that freedom of the press meant freedom for Berlusconi in his media baron guise. So they'd looked at WikiLeaks and wondered whether WikiLeaks represented an entire alternative future for the political system as a whole, where that um, kind of escape valve would rest not on the freedom of the press, but on the freedom of information. Information should be free without the mediation of, um, of industrial barons like, like Berlusconi. And they were looking in the book, Piracy, then, to see if there was a kind of historical pedigree for an entirely new political order. Um, now, as it happens, I'm slightly a skeptic about that kind of line. I, I think WikiLeaks has done good things, but that doesn't make it the key to a, a kind of utopia. Um, nonetheless, I do think that they were right to raise what at first seemed to me to be a rather kind of baffling insistence on the politics of this. They were right to insist that there is a politics to piracy, that the history of piracy is key to understanding why that's so, um, and that the politics can help us understand where we're going now as a result of, of that kind of historical understanding. Um, I want to talk today about the politics of piracy by focusing on two things. Um, one is the rise and consolidation of a whole industry devoted to fighting against pirates. I've come to call this the intellectual property defense industry um, and the, the kind of connotations of spending $100,000 for a lavatory seat are intended. Um, the other thing is the rise of popular resistance to that industry. So not so much piracy per se, but uh, forces like the, the uh, public demonstrations that we saw in this country, for example, over Soper and Pippa, the acts that, that Jim mentioned, the Stop Online Piracy Act and the Protect IP Act, um, which for the first time actually succeeded in um, heading off uh, an, uh, uh, some legislative measures that would have quite, dr quite drastically extended the measures for intellectual property protection. Um, behind those two things, though, the, the rise of a, an intellectual property defense industry and the beginnings of a kind of public resistance movement to that industry 
lie the resilience of piracy itself. And it's surely no surprise that piracy is resilient. Um, this, these are just to take uh, an example of, of representations of this. This comes from um, Interpol records of seizures in a particular huge operation that took place around South America called Operation Jupiter. Actually ran for about five years. This is one small part of it involving seizures in Uruguay for one of those five years in 2008. And you can see something of the, the range of, of goods that end up getting pirated. It's not just DVDs, it's not just movies and music. It's toys, cigarettes, uh, medicines, agrochemicals, um, and you can actually push it wider than that. Uh, some of you may know that there were some rather unnerving hearings in, the, uh, in Washington last year on the finding that uh, counterfeit and pirated aircraft parts were starting to appear even in the aircraft of the US military. Um, when you, by the time you've got pirated aircraft parts, then, then it's time to get nervous. Um, the effects of piracy globally are very difficult to ascertain, but there's been recent, recent estimates by the International Chamber of Commerce that it's about a, tr a trillion dollars per year that are cost to the, the world economy by uh, piracy and counterfeiting. Um, so it's something that's resilient, but it's also something that changes. Um, and it, there seems to be real evidence that piracy is changing uh, with the expansion, the relentless expansion of networked information. Um, so that image that so many of us have of piracy as being a matter of great stacks of discs of CDs and DVDs that are periodically piled up and bulldozed by the Chinese government in order to impress us, that image is increasingly out of date. Um, piracy is increasingly a matter of disembodied networked information being moved across national boundaries so they didn't exist, which of course they don't exist. They, they don't exist as far as the internet goes. So for example, um, I recently heard a presentation by a, a policeman from Hong Kong who'd found himself trying to track a company that was uh, dealing in pirated television program. And it turned out that this company had an official registration in one country. Um, it had servers in several other countries. It had a customer base in different countries again. And the content, as it were, these, these television programs, were served up by the equivalent of a P2P, a peer-to-peer -peer network, that was actually based in no one country, that went across different jurisdictions. Uh, the implications of that, if you're going to try to track, to know about, or to police it, are quite radical, because of course, police forces traditionally are constrained by jurisdictional boundaries, by nations. Um, if you're a policeman then, as a Hong Kong officer testified, you have to start building networks of your own, which end up mimicking the networks of the pirates. Um, and this is what the, the intellectual pr property defense industry essentially is. It's the effort to try to build those anti-pirate networks. Um, so um, the other thing to realize about that is that although police forces typically are constrained by national boundaries, to some extent, obviously they collaborate across nation states, but their, their jurisdictions are relatively local, corporations are not so restricted. For that reason, among others, the intellectual property defense industry has corporations at its heart. Microsoft, um, Monsanto, Adobe, uh, and many other electronics pharmaceutical companies you know, going quite far down the, the food chain, so it happened. Um, so the policing of an intellectual property is essentially now a private-public collaboration with corporations having their own um, divisions devoted to this, their own detective branches, and they have ongoing um, liaisons with national and supranational public agencies. Um, and we need to understand this, partly because what we know about piracy itself comes about through those collaborations. So when we bandy about numbers like piracy costs a trillion dollars to the global economy, how do we know that? Well, we know it because it's what that industry tells us. Um, and it comes about by data gathering techniques that have emerged through a research tradition created and sustained by that collaboration between the police and corporation. Um, so the intellectual property defense industry, as it's grown, is, is a private pub public collaboration. It is itself a knowledge industry. It's devoted to a large extent to creating and sustaining knowledge about piracy. And this knowledge then filters through, deliberately, it's meant to, uh, through enforcement agencies. 
to try to encourage ongoing programs like Operation Jupiter, out of which these seizures came. So there's one of the most interesting manifestations of this is the creation of colleges for intellectual property police. Um, this one is run by Interpol in collaboration with a firm called Underwriters Laboratories. Underwriters Laboratories is actually an interesting company. It runs back more than 100 years to fire insurance in the United States. And it, it creates those little symbols that appear on so many electrical devices and other devices to guarantee that they are authentic and tested for safety. Um, you can take co college courses in being an intellectual property crime investigator uh, in this online college, uh, licensed by Interpol. It's graduated something like, um, well, getting the numbers, maybe uh, 500, was it? No, 800 officers from 14 countries in the last five years or so. Um, there are other colleges like this. Uh, the US Patent and Trademarks Office runs its own, uh, which is called the Global IP Academy. And what they do is they send practicing agents from groups like the FBI out to train um, police in other countries on site. So I spoke to one FBI agent who, who'd just come back from training intellectual property police in um, somewhere in North Africa. It, was a, it, it sounded like a really, uh, you know, wouldn't be their highest priority, but, uh, but uh, this, he'd been posted out there. Um, and these kinds of knowledge enterprises are then secured and cemented by international congresses, of which there are two that happen re re relatively re routinely. A global congress on combating counterfeiting and piracy that happens every year. Uh, the most recent one was actually a month ago in Panama City, which I went down and participated in. Um, and um, a, another global con congress on the international law enforcement for intellectual, inter for intellectual property that happens slightly less frequently, and the next one of those is going to be in Istanbul in 2013. These are venues for building informal networks. Uh, one of the participants said to me that for all the presentations and the data and the, the operational details that are circulated at these meetings, the most important thing about them is that you swap, um, you meet people such that when you want to track a pirate network across national boundaries, not only do you know who to, who to call, but they will call you back. That's how the, uh, the policing of piracy is actually proceeding. It's by the, the creation of these informal, corporate, public, transnational uh, in, interaction. Um, so what are the implications of the, the development of this hybrid industry? Well, one is that the identification of piracy itself has solidified and standardized. Um, and it's an interesting identification, rhetorically, um, because often it zeroes in not on piracy per se at all, but on counterfeiting which is different. So piracy, crudely, piracy it, it refers to um, copyright or patent theft. Counterfeiting usually refers to trademarks. The idea with counterfeiting is that you pass something off as genuine when it's in fact fake. Uh, whereas with piracy, what you're actually producing is, is, is a copy, right? And you're often not trying to pass it off as actually the original, in a certain way. Um, that's one thing. Uh, which means that issues of trust and authenticity are at the core. Um, and in particular, they're at the core in collaboration with, a, with um, uh, concepts of public health. So the prime instance of piracy for this industry is no longer records or movies or books. It is pharmaceuticals. Um, and the, the locus classicus, the, the classic case that's always referred to, is something like cough medicine. Counterfeit cough medicine is produced, actually, this is true, it's produced in large quantities, it's consumed and it can kill and has killed. Um, that has the effect, of course, that if, you, if your aim is to increase enforcement, to produce more laws, to, to you know, expand the, the anti-piracy effort, it's going to be more effective to, to produce that kind of rhetoric. Now, people in local communities are going to be more sympathetic to the expansion of laws if they think that the target is, um, is you know, counterfeit pharmaceutical makers um, and the beneficiary is local children, rather than if the target is teenage downloaders in bedrooms and the beneficiary is you know, some big record company. Um, the other thing is that the, 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 the definition of piracy has become a trans-border one. 
Um, now, it's always been the case historically, you go back hundreds of years and find that piracy has in fact taken place across borders. But what's different now is that increasingly, in the eyes of Interpol and these colleges, the, um, the transport, the international character of it, is actually an essential part of its definition. In fact, Interpol these days is pushing the line that we should not be prioritizing the fight against piracy at all as such. We should think of it as part of a general fight against what it calls trafficking in illicit goods, where goods includes everything up to and including human beings. So in this light, piracy and counterfeiting become part of the same issue as sex trafficking, drug trafficking, and terrorism. Um, and again, you can see that this would have a kind of political resonance and an impact. It helps to encourage the expansive inc increase of laws like ACTA and, and SOPA and PIPA and so forth. But it's important to note that this is not just for external consumption. Um, if, you, if you attend these congresses of the intellectual property police themselves, this rhetoric is absolutely ubiquitous there too. It's what they tell each other. Um, so down in Panama, the, the story about the story that, that terrorists are funded by uh, piracy was was referred to several times in the, the sessions in this, this meeting, including by the president of Interpol. And I never once heard anybody question it, even though, in fact, social scientists can tell you that, that the evidence for that kind of link is actually extremely scanty. It's not entirely non-existent, but it's, it's not very plentiful. Um, so, um, so maybe one effect of this rhetoric intended or not, is actually to increase standardization and commitment within the, the anti-piracy industry itself. Um, the other effect of it is to try to, is to, is to increase and change the character of anti-piracy technologies. Now again, this is an old thing, the idea that you can perhaps count combat piracy by inventing an anti-piracy technology. It goes right back to the 17th century, actually. It, the bid for anti-piracy technologies have changed, though with the, this idea that piracy is now essentially a trans-border networked activity and that pharmaceuticals are its, its acme case. Um, so now, an anti-piracy technology will be a network technology. It won't be some, some kind of individual tag or something like that. Um, the, the prime example of which are what you might think of as registration and, registration and uh, networking devices. RFID is the great example, radio frequency identification, as used in the, the fight against counterfeit medicines. This is the World Health Organization's impact group, which is the task force against, um, against counterfeit medicine. Um, Interpol also runs a database on international intellectual property crime, and it runs, a, now as of 2012, a global register, which supposedly collects information from manufacturers and allows anybody, you or, you or I included, you with a smartphone, to immediately scan any kind of object. And in theory, it will immediately connect into this global register and tell you whether that object is authentic or not. The idea is to recruit all of us and the internet itself into a massive authentication enterprise. Um, and as you can see, the participants in this extend already across most of the world. This, this project was actually announced at Google, of all places, um, in mid-2012, in the middle of a, of a session called Illicit Networks, Forces in Opposition, or INFO, typically NEAT acronym, um, which captures something of the character of the battle as these people see it, that they, they see themselves as networks fighting other networks. Um, another, another example of this, there are various different examples of these, these identification and network systems that operate across different regimes. Um, this one is particularly ironic in a certain sense in that this is the, the model that's championed by the tobacco industry, which turns out to be a great uh, supporter of the idea of these, these authentication systems. Um, Codentify is the particular protocol adopted by the tobacco industry to fight against counterfeit cigarettes. And of course, the ironies of this industry, among all industries, um, tying itself to a public health auth authentication of information line don't bear really thinking about. Um, so this is a, a, a kind of dream that's existed for hundreds of years, anti-pirate technology, that you could solve the problem of piracy by some kind of technological innovation. Um, goes right back to Robert Boyle in the 17th century. This is Robert Boyle's anti-pirate technology. It's a precision balance for telling um, the specific gravities of medicines or foodstuffs or wines or even gems, actually. Um, but what's different about it now is that it's networked and it has the ambition 
to be transnational, to be tran transcultural in that way. Um, there are, though, problems that attend these kinds of systems that take on new forms. You know, they're all problems about authenticity, trust, verification. They take on new problems with the network character of these, these technologies. Um, for example, if you take radio frequency ID tags, these are tag tags that you put on usually medical medicine bottles, and you, they have little radio frequency transmitters in them, and you can you can scan them, and they will they will provide a record of the transference of a certain bottle of medicine through the entire supply chain from manufacturer to, to customer. And the idea is that, that any counterfeit medicines will be caught by not having one of these. Um, there are several problems with this, one of which is that these tags, of course, attach not to medicines but to containers. So what you're actually tracking are little plastic boxes. And manufacturers, not just manufacturers, but, but middlemen companies routinely change the boxes in which drugs are held for perfectly legitimate reasons to do with marketing. And in 2005, the head of Novartis's global security program, um, Novartis has a global security program, um, told Congress what the implications of this were. And it's a kind of interesting line. He said, counterfeiters generally deal not only with counterfeit product, but with diverted, expired, and stolen product. Envision, then, the scenario where a counterfeiter steals product, removes genuine product from the secure packages with the RFID tag on it, and then puts the counterfeit product in these packages reinserting the counterfeit product back into the system. The counterfeit product would pass through all of the readers successfully. What then happens to the genuine product? The irony is that the genuine product would most likely be repackaged in counterfeit packaging with unreadable tags and entered into the distribution system. If the RFID system works correctly then, the genuine product would be kicked out of the system, but later determined to be genuine. Undermining, Novartis says, any confidence in this system and that, that's really a, a revealing piece of, of uh, testimony, as I say, to the US Congress about the drawbacks of a, of a, a dream of a kind of all-encompassing anti-pirate technology. It, with that dream of, a, of a, an anti-pirate utopia comes something like a reality or a threat that you would completely, systematically erode trust in vital systems of modernity. In fact, one of the other experts testifying at that point said that in the end, um, the consumer, as she put it, will still be relying on trust in the local apothecary, which is exactly what Robert Boyle was worried about in the 17th century. You have to trust two apothecaries. And he invented the idea that you might have a machine that would allow you to get away from that problem of trust. Um, never worked. So, um, now that's not to say that things like network registration systems can't work. It's to say that their work is A, always compromised, and B, that it always involves constriction somewhere else in the social system. So you can have an RFID system that might work, but you only have it if it, already, if it sits on a policing culture that already exists, because you have to confirm it all the way through the supply chain by, by seeing what it is that companies are doing to these packages, and that takes legwork. So in other words, you need the detectives actually out there on the ground in order to confirm the trust that you have in the technological system that's supposed to confirm your trust. Um, but this is part of an increasingly Baroque armory of all of these technological devices. We're familiar with some of these things, digital rights management algorithms in, in books, uh, which are designed to prevent piratical copying and sometimes any copying. These things are notoriously insensitive to issues of fair use, for example. Um, automated algorithms that track through the web and seek to, seek to detect what look to them like um, the illicit use of copyrighted material and that then automatically issue takedown demands, resulting in absurdities like NASA finding that its own site has to remove content from its, its Mars lander as it approaches the Martian surface, because some news corporation's automatic tracker has identified this as a piratical use of its material. Um, the problem with that you have automation without any kind of human interaction, which leads to, to these kinds of things. Um, the, uh, crippling of organisms in agribusiness uh, because the patent holder of a genetic modification has included in it a kind of gene trigger which will, which will cripple the organism unless you can show that the uh, use of that organism is legitimate where legitimacy is defined by the patent holder. Um, all, of these. all of these technologies have a certain kind of utopian character to them. They all are notoriously insensitive the complexities of everyday practice. 
And the, the reason for that is that the problem they're seeking to address, piracy, is not itself intrinsically technological. It's, it's cultural, it's, it's economic, it's political, and in a word, it's historical. It's something that's emerged over long periods of, of uh, practice. So IP anti-pirate technologies promise to make intellectual property strong. And they do, or they can at least, but they do so at the expense of making it brittle. They, you know, they, they raise opposition. Um, and that's where you get the, the advent of the second thing that I want to talk about, which is the, these popular movements, not so much in favor of piracy per se, but against the anti-pirate measures, against bills like SOPA and PIPA, um, ADOPI, which is a similar kind of act in France, uh, the Digital Economy Act in Britain, ACTA, the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, which seems to have bitten the dust now, um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is the latest successor to ACTA, which is going through secret negotiations at this moment. Um, all of these draw a great, great deal of media attention and increasingly excite opposition, which is a new thing, especially the, the downfall of SOPA and PIPA, I think, really may have been a turning point. Um, I do want to say, though, that I think that the public campaigns against these acts of legislation are to some extent um, misdirected. Because if you look at the, the legislation, it, in, it, it tends to arise out of practical cultures of enforcement of this kind that I've been speaking about here with these network technology. Um, SOPA, PIPA, ACTA, and so forth arise when the anti-piracy industry has been already deploying the methods that these laws would validate and has hit problems in doing so, typically with the courts. And it's when they hit the problems that the draft legislation starts to appear. The public campaigns then would be well advised to attend to the practical culture of enforcement more than to the, the Capitol Hill culture of passing legislation. And that may even be an opportunity because there is a sense in which the enforcement culture has to be more open than some of the private negotiations that take place up on Capitol Hill or in the World Trade Organization. Um, the problem with things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership and campaign against it is that we don't know what's being negotiated about. Um, we can know what uh, the FBI, the, um, the, the ICE, the various, the various public agencies are doing to enforce intellectual property. Um, there's a long history to that too. Intellectual property enforcement has long found itself running up against court uh, readings of the law. Uh, you can go back through the early 20th century when the music industry deployed an army of what it called commandos to take down music pirates before World War I. And these commandos often found themselves had up in front of judges who would accuse them of assault. Um, in that context, protecting the intellectual property of the music publishers didn't seem so important as upholding the common law. Um, now, if there's a, an enduring legacy of these moments of public resistance, it may be the pirate parties of which there are now quite a few across the world. I just took this from Wikimedia this morning, a uh, map of the world's pirate parties. Um, since 2010, they've been united under a pirate international, um, and they've won public representation in several countries, in Germany, in the Czech Republic, in Spain, Austria, Switzerland. Um, they all have public representatives in their assemblies. In Sweden, which is where the pirate party started as a result of a controversy about taking down the pirate bay, um, there are actually, the, the, the Pirate Party has actually managed to send representatives to the European Parliament. Um, in other countries, including the United States, the Pirate Parties exist but are pretty invisible, um, which is probably in large part due to the electoral systems that exist in those countries. The same is true in the UK and in France. Um, now, overall, it seems like these, these Pirate Parties are not really a flash in the pan. They've proved themselves to be sufficiently robust that one can't just dismiss them as that. I do think, however, it's more probable that the trajectory that pirate politics of this form is going to take is going to be more like that of green politics in the 80s and 90s. That is, pirate parties may survive, but the future of pirate politics of, the, of their kind is going to be more that of opportunistic um, appropriation by the major political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans in this country, the Conservatives and Labour in the UK, and so forth. Um, that may be frustrating to the pirate partisan, um, but perhaps it's a bit appropriate that they'll end up walking each major party's pirate plank. The major party will have a pirate plank in its, in its platform. Um, and in historical terms, it would be a real achievement. You know, 
anti-intellectual property politics has existed for a long time, going right, way back into the 18th century, if not before. But it's always been rather inconstant um, and disconnected. This would be the first time that it became a kind of ongoing standard political concern in the way that green issues have become that. And that may be a bigger achievement than the emergence of an otherwise ineffective digital culture third way would be. Um, now finally, I just want to give you a sense of, of how this kind of works out on the ground. Um, I'm just going to conclude with this. Um, how does this work out? Well, there are some great examples. You could choose from more or less any country in the world. This one comes from India, where Bollywood, the, the great Indian film industry, has been pioneering some aggressive anti-pirate actions of its own. In 2010, it hired a company called Aplex to take the fight to the pirates, as, as Bollywood announced it would be using pirate tactics to beat the pirates. It employed what it called cyber hitmen to attack websites that, that had Bollywood movies on them, including the Pirate Bay. Um, and it did this by the automated use of bot-like software that went through the net trawling for movie files. Um, and it would, it would launch denial of service attacks on the websites that it targeted and that refused to take down their files. Now that's a problematic strategy though, partly because denial of service attacks, you know these things where you, you basically bombard a site with, with requests and the site goes down because it can't handle the traffic. These are risky things to do. In many countries they're actually illegal because they damage the, the status of the networks. Um, more than that, they attract retaliation. So Aplex, Bollywood, and then the RIA, the MPAA in this country, found themselves retaliated against by the anonymous group of hackers, um, launching, a group, launching a, an operation called Payback is a Bitch. Um, they uh, went after Aplex first, and then, as I said, this became a much bigger operation, in some sense going on even today. Um, they took down Aplex's site within a day, uh, and then went on to the, the other major corporations, the MPAA, the RIA in this country, and then after that, MasterCard, because it, it had been uh, damaging to WikiLeaks. And the tool of, of choice was something called the Low Orbit Iron Cannon, which comes out of a video game. Um, this, is, this is something how you could sign up as, a, as any computer owner to be, become a kind of participant in one of these distributed denial of service attacks. Something that I don't recommend instead of using this technology, which is now obsolete because um, it was very easy for the FBI and other forces to track who was signing up. Um, so Apex got taken down, and in the end, the anti-pirate forces were at least temporarily crippled by a kind of pro-piracy backlash, libertarian style of, of political action. Now, the thing about this is that the consuls of the information society itself, I think, are, sh are shaped by countless encounters of this kind. The legislative frameworks that we have are shaped by the results of these kinds of encounters. The legislation is often framed in order to deal with this kind of experience. Um, and if you were an alien anthropologist who came down with no knowledge of this, it would be very hard to tell a priori which were the good guys and which were the bad guys. For example, uh, so here you have the, the, the supposed good guys, the police, launching denial of service attacks against websites overseas. The retaliation is denial of service attacks against you. The tool of choice, the low orbit iron cannon, was, that's actually a piece of software that was invented by the intellectual property defense industry to act as a probe for testing the security systems on, on major corporations. It was an open source piece of software though, so Anonymous took it over and just turned it into a weapon. So it was no longer doing probes, it was actually doing attacks. So even the weapons are actually the same. And I think that what we need to appreciate in appreciating something like the politics of piracy is that kind of complexity that um, there, it's not really the case, when you start looking at these kinds of practical details, that you can clearly identify good or bad, secure and insecure, trustworthy and inauthentic, and so forth. All of these things are historically emergent, and the mundane realities of information itself, that is how we, as citizens, can obtain and move around and deal with and store and change uh, information, all of those things depend on something like the resultant of these kinds of conflicts, especially as they're written into legislation, as I said. And finally, last of all, the reason why all this matters, the reason why this matters, the reason why the intellectual property defense industry, these, these private public collaborations, the international character of them, the network character of them, the reason why all of that matters, it's not that the intellectual property defenders are necessarily wrong in thinking that to defend intellectual property or information in general, you have to adopt these kinds of controversial practices, things that rub up against 
other prized cultural values, like freedom of speech, um, the, the, the uh, intrinsic qualities of property, for example. Um, and it's also not the case that the defenders of information or intellectual property are necessarily fighting a losing war on behalf of the last generation and against the future, as a lot of Digerati tend to say. The reason to be concerned is not that, that the industry is wrong. The reason to be concerned is that the industry might actually be right. Uh, it may be that information, with all of the benefits that we get from it, can only be upheld by making compromises elsewhere in the complex social contract of late modernity. And perhaps those com compromises, therefore, should be made. And the real question is not kind of whether you have to make compromises. It's what the compromises should be and where you draw the line. That's the political question. Um, and in a certain way, it maps onto the most ancient political questions of all. Who guards the guards? This is something that was asked by Cicero in the ancient world. Um, one of the characteristics of the intellectual property defense industry is that it's completely unaccountable. You know, there's even a sense in which somebody like Kim.com is more accountable than the information defenders. Um, we have no institutional framework for rendering this industry, the, the, inf the information police, accountable. And there's no proposals to create one. Um, it would be nice to have such a thing. I think that having such a thing may be the key in the end to reconciling intellectual property with something like the good society. Um, so I'll stop with that. <laughs> <laughs>